Dr. Lambert. So hi, everyone, and welcome to this lecture on being occupied for well-being, an introduction to occupational therapy. So this is going to be a high-level overview of what is occupation and occupational therapy. How does it differ from how you usually understand the word occupation in the English language? And how people can be helped or benefit from occupational therapy. So throughout the lesson, I'll be asking you some questions on like your reflections from what you're hearing from the presentation. So like Dr. Lambert said, you may use the chat box or you can raise your hat using the reactions in Zoom so that we can call on you and give you the floor. So I'd like to introduce myself briefly. I'm a licensed occupational therapist in the Philippines, specializing in adult neuromuscular and musculoskeletal rehabilitation. But I also handle pediatric and occasionally um, clients with mental health concerns. I've been an educator for the Department of Occupational Therapy of the University of the Philippines, Manila, for the past 11 years. And I've also taken master's units in medical anthropology. So that's where I'm coming from. I want to start this presentation with a question, and I'd like you to take your time to think about this. Have you ever been unable to do something because of a physical, mental, or behavioral difficulty? So I'd like to give you a bit of time. And while you're thinking, I'll give some examples so that you can uh, use that for your reflection. An example of a physical difficulty would be like if you sprained your ankle, you might find it difficult to work or to, to walk to your job or walk to the grocery. For mental difficulty, maybe you found it more difficult to concentrate on your lessons or on what you need to do after getting COVID. So there's been a lot of that um, going around after COVID. For emotional difficulties, maybe you might find it difficult to find motivation to do things around the house while you're grieving the loss of a family member or a pet. So every one of us has had these experiences. And so I'd like to give you like a few seconds or a minute to think about this. And I'd, I'd like to hear from two or three people in the session. Like, can you share your own experience of being finding it difficult to do something. Waiting a little bit, see if anybody's going to write. Yeah, I'll give them a little time to type in the chat or if somebody wants to raise their hand and share their experience. You know, there are some things like if you want to sleep in and you can't go to work because you want to sleep in, is that occupa occupational therapy? Uh, we'll talk about the scope of OT later, but yeah, we we help people who have issues with sleep as well. Yeah, so that's it's the, the question is very general. So it, it could involve addictions that people have that, that keep them from actually performing on their job. And all yeah, yeah. Things. Oh, yay. We have our first. Um, Raul Person. George, here we go. Ask him to unmute his microphone. Hi, Hi good, good morning. Um, Hi. Raul, George, Raul George from, from a very far distance from here, Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean. Now, oh. the, question, the question is a real, real question for me because, you know, I have been trying, I don't know if this will fit into the schema, but... Mm -hmm. I have been trying to do some some business really on the um, on the on the internet, and yeah. um, you know you have been engaged with a lot of people who say that they are experts, and when you do your investments, the, the challenge is that you see it don't work out. So um, it, it, after investing and recognizing that it doesn't work out, it becomes so for me mentally and emotionally um, distressed and somebody else will come with a very good idea that seems to cover all the bases but then mm -hmm. you have a challenge and a limitation as to whether you would want to pursue it because of all your past experiences yeah. could that fit into the schema of things yeah yeah that's a very good example thank you Raul so that's something that every one of us has experienced that we've all had our own failures in life and sometimes some failures feel more difficult or heavier than others and like what raw raw was it raw shared that he 
feels he, it felt very heavy for him, like mentally, emotionally, maybe his self-esteem got dented. And therefore, when there are business opportunities that come by, or maybe even other opportunities, not necessarily for work, they might feel like they're not capable of taking those on because they don't feel they don't feel that they're capable or able of doing those. So thank you all. Yes, that's one example. It's one good example that fits um, into what we're going to talk about today. Is there anybody else who wants Faith to share? <clears throat> Faith Kaube, can you see yeah. the two um, messages in chat, one from Lynette yeah, and one from Emmanuel. Uh, physically, Lynette Bailey had chick V and mentally maybe feeling down and not wanting to do anything. So yes, sometimes when we're coming off of an illness um, or as if we're dealing with a chronic illness, then there might be times where your energy might not be 100% and maybe you can't do everything that you want to do in a day or maybe you don't have the motivation to get up from bed because you just want to rest and yeah Emmanuel Hakizimana shared that it may happen that we when that when they fail to do something that they get they feel depressed so it's similar to what Raul shared earlier so thank you for sharing that and Safo Boy uh, shared that they recently lost their nephew and that they feel emotional difficulties. My condolences, um, Sappho. So yeah, those are examples of normal or common things that we encounter in life. So they're not even necessarily because of any conditions or disabilities that we have. All of us have experiences where we're unable, even temporarily, to do something because our physical, mental, or emotional capabilities are just not up to the task. Thank you everyone for sharing. So let's talk about what is occupation. And now in the English language, people often think it's something related to a job or work. And that's because that's how it's defined in the dictionary. But the concept of occupation and occupational therapy is actually much more expansive than that. So the World Federation of Occupational Therapists define occupations as everyday activities that people do as individuals, in families, and with their communities to occupy their time and to bring meaning and purpose to life. And these include the things that you need to do, you want to do, or you're expected to do. So basically, occupations are anything that you do that occupy your time, has meaning, and bring purpose to your life. So let's take two examples in our next slide. Right, so on the left, we have a child who's maybe 10 years old, and on the right, we have young adults. So let's look at the child first. Right, so what activities or tasks do you think a 10-year-old child needs to do, wants to do, or is expected to do? So give you some time to think about that again. We were all 10-year-old children once. What did your 10-year-old self did to occupy your time? Or if you have children yourselves, what did they do to occupy their time? So I have the chat open here. I'll give examples later, but I want to see what uh, you know, play, read, and interact with others. Rawl, thank you again, Rawl, for sharing. So Rawl says that a 10-year-old child probably either needs, wants, or is expected to play, read, and interact with others. Watch cartoons. Yeah. Thank you, Patricia Adzo. Maybe a child wants to watch cartoons or fun shows on TV, not study, although they're expected to study or they need to study, right? Thanks, everyone. So you can keep on typing your answers in the chat. It'd be interesting to see also like cultural differences um, in terms of what you think a child needs to do, wants to do, or is expected to do. So for example, um, in the Philippines, 
at a certain age, at 10 years old, a child can actually still be um, helped by their parents to dress. Like it's not unusual for them to uh, be helped in dressing. Whereas, for example, in more Western cultures, they're expected to learn to dress themselves a little bit earlier and to be more independent. So here we have Asha Brick Nan. I'm sorry, I, I hope I'm saying your names right. If not, please correct me. Learn to do housework. Oh, this is interesting. So for Asher Brick, they said that a 10-year-old child might be expected to do housework. So there might be some cultural differences regarding that. All right, so in general, a 10-year-old child maybe needs to participate in group activities at school. Um, this child is usually of school age, so they usually need to learn how to work with classmates in, in group activities at school, you know, learn how to recite in class, how to interact with teachers, and maybe they want to make friends and play because this is a time when socialization becomes important to them and children want to make friends and to play with them. So some of you answered that earlier. And at 10 years old, they're expected to be able to have appropriate conversations at their level with other people. So they can ask and answer simple questions and maybe they can have conversations with their friends. So these are things that occupy a child's time. But what happens when this child has, for example, a difficulty with social skills, for example, like those with autism? So what do you think will happen to the occupations or the tasks listed here? So let me open my here. So let's go to the first one, needs to participate in group activities at school. They might find it difficult to conform to unspoken social rules because that's something that, um, for example, children with autism sometimes find difficulty with. They might find it difficult to make friends and play because they find it difficult to maintain eye contact or even initiate conversations. And they might have, and when they're able to initiate conversations, they might have difficulty following along topics because some of them tend to fixate on certain topics that pique their interest. And so when they have certain difficulties, all of their occupations sometimes are affected. Now let's look at the other scenario for adults. And this might be a little bit closer um, to the experiences of some of you. So what activities or tasks does a 25-year-old adult need to do, want to do, or is expected to do? Let's give him some time to type in the chat. Go to work, right? Thank you, Patricia. So this is actually one of the main occupations or things that occupy the time of an adult is that they need to go to work. And Asherbrick shared happening with friends or going out with friends. Lynette share that being social, have a good education, or maybe to finish your education and to have a good job, right? So for most cultures, a 25-year-old is expected, this is usually working age, and therefore adults are expected to be productive and working towards success in their chosen career. And they might also uh, want to go out with their friends because at this age, they're cultivate, cultivating the relationships that will follow or that they'll carry throughout their adult life. And at this age, they're expected to be self-sufficient in their daily self-care. Now, what happens when this person gets a fracture on their dominant hand? So how many of you here have had fractures? Hopefully none, but it's a fairly common um, injury. How many of you here have had fractures? If you could raise your hand using the reaction button in Zoom, or if you just want to type in the chat. I would be very surprised if nobody here has ever had um, a fracture. It doesn't look like anybody has had a fracture. All right. So, um, 
let's say that this person broke their hand. What do you think will happen to the occupations that's listed here? So for example, let's just take like a general desk work kind of occupation, like maybe being a secretary. If they're a secretary, of course, they have to type, maybe using a laptop or using a typewriter. And if they only have one hand, what do you think will happen to their ability to type? So obviously, they'll be much slower. It's not that they can't type because they have their other hand, but they'll be a lot slower because they only have one hand to maybe use a keyboard or use a mouse or just one hand to do everything. If they want to go out with their friends, how do you think can they drive with one hand? Or if you think about the public transportation where you live, are you able to navigate public transportation if you can't use one of your hands? So for example, in the Philippines, there might be certain public transportations like trains that would be all right, but we do have our local public transport. I'm not sure if you're familiar with like Jeep, jeepneys. So those can be a little tricky to get into if you only have just one hand because you do need to hold on to it. Otherwise, you might get into an accident. And this is where there's going to be a lot of effect, like in terms of their self-care, bathing, dressing. Do you think they'll be able to do all of these in the same efficient and effective way if they only have one hand? Most of the time, it's actually very difficult. So those are just some ways where how the ways that you do your occupations or the things that are important to you can be affected whenever you have a physical, a mental, or an emotional difficulty. So this is the question that I want you to keep in your mind as we discuss the scope of occupations. What are the things that you need to do, want to do, and are expected to do that are meaningful and important to you. And as we go through the different kinds of occupations and um, the different categories, I want you to think about your own life and see how you can answer this question. Now that you have a bit of an idea what occupation is, what is occupational therapy? So just a little bit of a caveat. In the Philippines, we're more aligned with the American occupational therapy practice frame framework. So most of the definitions and scope of practice that I will be discussing is a little bit more in line with the American framework. Depending on where you live, there might be some differences with regards to like scope, how um, certain occupational therapy practices are delineated. According to the American Occupational Therapy Association, occupational therapy is defined as the therapeutic use of everyday life occupations with persons, groups, or populations for the purpose of enhancing or enabling participation. So as a health profession, our goal is for our clients to achieve health, well-being, and participation in life. And the way that we do that is engaging them in their valued occupations. So occupational therapy intervention focuses on creating or facilitating opportunities to engage in occupations that lead to participation in desired life situations. So we'll talk more about how assessment and management goes towards the end of this presentation, let's look first at some important terms from the WHO so that we can understand this definition better. So from the World Health Organization, they define health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. This means that to say that someone is healthy, it's not enough that they don't have any illnesses or they don't have any disabilities. In fact, just because you don't have any diagnosed illness or disability doesn't necessarily mean that you are healthy. And what does well-being mean? Well-being is a general term encompassing the total universe of human life domains, including physical, mental, and social aspects that make up what can be called a good life. More specifically, well-being is about having a quality of life and being able to contribute to the world around you in a meaningful way. And quality of life is the way that you see your position in life in the context of your culture and value systems and in relation to your goals, expectations, standards, and concerns. So it's you alone can decide whether do you have a good quality of life or can your quality of life be improved further? Because this is very subjective, although there are some objective measures of this. Okay. 
engagement and occupation is being able to do the occupations that you want to do because you choose to do them and because they are meaningful to you. And lastly, participation is being actively involved in carrying out occupations or daily life activities based on the roles that you want to take. So one example to differentiate occupational engagement and life participation is vacuuming, scrubbing a kitchen counter, cooking, all of those are occupational engagement. But doing all of those occupations because you are performing the role of a home maintainer, or for example, a parent who is taking care of your home for your family, that is life participation. It's just a brief history of occupational therapy. In the 1900s, uh, it really started out along with the start of the arts and crafts movement and the moral treatment area. So mental health institutions used work activities and leisure activities to promote learning through doing, provide a creative outlet for patients, and to serve as a way to avoid boredom during long hospital stays. Now this began in Europe, but it eventually moved to the US and in fact, the U.S. is technically the birthplace of occupational therapy. In the 1910s, Eleanor Clark Slagle, known as the mother of occupational therapy, established the Henry B. Favell School of Occupations in Chicago, the first training school for occupational therapists. So this is based on the philosophy that engagement in meaningful routines shape a person's well-being and that habit training which is what she proposed as a primary occupational therapy model of treatment back then, focuses on creating structures and balance between work, rest, and leisure. So you have to understand that this started out in the inpatient setting. So these are patients who are in the hospital who can't go home. And for those who have been in the hospital for any period of time, I'm sure you know just how much you lose your sense of identity and even routine just by staying even a couple of days in a hospital. And so for those who stay long-term in a hospital, what Eleanor Slagle wanted to do was to sort of give them that structure and balance that they would have gotten if they were at home, but which disappears from them when they're, for, when they're in the hospital for inpatient treatment. And from 1914 to 1918, this was World War I. And what happened was that vast numbers of wounded men from the war required people to assist them to resume their daily living roles. And in fact, there was an escalating number of injured and disabled soldiers that were proving to be a challenge to those in command. So the military enlisted the assistance of the beginning OTs then to recruit and train reconstruction aides, that's what they called them back then, to help with the rehabilitation of those wounded in war. So occupational therapy started out as sort of inpatient treatment in mental health facilities, but because of the war, it suddenly shifted into more physical, very medical models um, because of the conditions that usually result from war, such as traumatic injuries, um, amputations, gunshot injuries. So from there, occupational therapy borrowed and used principles and techniques from multiple disciplines such as physical therapy, nursing, psychiatry, social work, psychology, and learning fields. And now the profession has gone beyond a pure focus on the medical model and habit training and continues to grow and define its scope and settings of practice, which we'll look at briefly in a while. All right. So you now have a bit of an idea what occupation is, but the, I think that there's still a question. So what is exactly is it that occupational therapists do or what is it that they look like if they're a health profession? So this is probably the most iconic diagram in OT. This is called the PEO um, model, the person environment and occupation model. And basically an occupational therapist will look at all of those when we look at clients. So we'll look at each one by one. And of course, 
we'll start with occupation. So we've defined occupations earlier, but now let's look at the specific categories of occupation that we look at. So these have evolved in a lot of ways. For example, rest and sleep used to be part of activities of daily living. Health management used to be part of instrumental activities of daily living. But um, this is the current version that's used by the American Occupational um, Therapy Association. We'll take our time going through these so you can get a sense of the scope of what exactly we look like, we look at, but the discussion won't be exhaustive and I won't list every single occupation under each one because that would take us forever. We can be here for five hours and we won't end our discussion. So I'll just um, discuss enough for you to kind of understand what goes under each category. And let's start with activities of daily living. So these are things that you do that are oriented towards taking care of your own body and usually completed on a daily or a routine basis. So think of the things that you do every day as part of self-care. For example, bathing. So that would include getting your bathing supplies, soaping, rinsing, and drying off. Using a toilet. So that would include managing your clothing, being able to transfer yourself to a toilet. And toilets are very cultural. So some this is what a toilet looks like in a lot of um, Western homes. But for example, in some um, areas in the Philippines, a toilet can be like a hole in the ground or a hole in the floor. So there are cultural aspects to this as well. Dressing, selecting clothing, being able to dress and undress, being able to use fasteners. And feeding, like setting up your plate and food, bring the food and drink to mouth. So these are the everyday things that you don't really think about that are important to you until you're unable to do them. So for example, the, our example earlier of a 25-year-old with a fracture, maybe they find it difficult to take a bath because they can't get their cast wet or they, can't, they find it difficult to dress because they can't fasten their jeans with just one hand. And then suddenly, that's when they realize my ability to do these things is so important to my ability to function every day, and I don't think about it. Next would be instrumental activities of daily living. So these are activities that support your daily life within your home and your community. They're more complex than ADLs, and they often require more complex and higher skills. So for example, taking care of others, like your family and your pets, doing household chores like laundry, vacuuming, cooking meals, driving and using public transportation, and managing finances. So health management activities are related to managing and maintaining health and wellness routines. So this includes managing your physical and mental health needs, like maybe getting regular exercise or being able to manage your emotions or cope with difficult situations, managing your medications, making sure that you're taking your medication on a routine basis, and nutrition, making sure that you're getting nutrition in line with your health goals or based on the recommendations of your doctor. Next, we have rest and sleep. So these are activities related to obtaining restorative rest and sleep that are needed in order to, so that, so that you can have energy to do your other occupations. So example of rest would be relaxing activities that restore energy and calm. Now this can be very individual. So for some people, maybe they wanna go on a hike or go out on a boat, on a yacht, and that renews their energy. For some people, maybe rest would be just lying down in bed and not doing anything. Or for some people, rest would be watching Netflix or watching television. Sleep preparation, like getting ready for bed, setting up your sleep space, establishing sleep routines, and sleep participation, getting enough quality and quantity of sleep. So education, these are activities needed for learning and participating in an educational environment. Now it can be a formal learning environment like what we're doing right now, or it can be more informal like Googling a topic that you're interested in or searching on YouTube how to cook your favorite dish.
So work, this is labor or exertion related to the development, production, delivery, or management of objects and services. So included here would be seeking employment and applying for jobs, your job performance, and participating in volunteer activities. So it doesn't have to be just paid work. Even volunteer activities are considered under work. Next, we have play. So these are activities that are fun, imaginative, and that you are motivated to do because you want to do them. It's typically associated with children, but actually adults play too. And it's important that adults play for creativity and for a lot of other benefits. So examples of play would be, for example, children doing pretend play. You'll see them doing role playing amongst themselves, or for example, for play activities that adults can do, video games, board games, or playing with toys. Leisure activities are the activities that you do in your spare time, either for relaxation, competition, or growth. So it can be for socializing, for pleasure, for meditating. Um, here are just some things that you can and some things that would fall under here, so like painting, sports. Now, there is an overlap between play and leisure, but in general, you can kind of see the difference between them in that play is inherently fun, whereas leisure may not be fun. It may be relaxing, but it's not necessarily fun. And last, we have social participation. So this is these are activities that involve social interaction with others, including your friendships, your family relationships or intimate partner relationships and your work relationships. So that's quite a lot, right? For something for an occupational therapist to look at. Uh, and that is a common um, reaction. So what happens is when somebody has a difficulty, like for example, the person who got a fracture in their hand, of course, it's not just one activity that is affected. So we have to look at all of these um, occupations that they need to do or they want to do or expected to do, even though they have this sort of um, condition or disability. The next in our PEO diagram is the person. So we're all, we'll also sort of breeze through this, but again, this is a high level overview, um, just so you can kind of understand the scope of OT. So these are all the factors that are found within you, within all of us. Personal factors are the particular background of your life and living that are not part of your health condition. So it would include demographic factors like age, gender, ethnicity, your lifestyle, your level of education, and your upbringing. These are patterns of living that are influenced by your context, which can support or hinder performance. Habits are automatic behaviors that you have. For example, who among you check your phone while you're walking? Or who among you leave your keys in the same place when you come home? So those are habits. And some habits help, like for example, leaving your keys in the same place all the time. And some habits don't quite help. Routines are patterns of behavior that provide structure to your daily life, like a morning routine or a weekend routine. And roles are aspects of your identity that are shaped by your culture and context, like being a parent or being an employee. Values, beliefs, and spirituality are per perceptions, motivations, and other things that influence your ability to find meaning in what you do. So how do these affect occupations? So for example, for some clients, their need for independence is very great that they, they want to do everything as independently as possible. They don't want help. They don't want a caregiver giving them assistance. And they don't want to use adaptive devices like a wheelchair. Whereas for some people, they're okay with getting a caregiver or relying on a family member for help. And as occupational therapists, we have to keep those in mind when we're doing our treatments with our clients, because if we make them do something that's not in line with what they believe in or the values that are important to them, then they're going to not do what we ask them to do, so, which means that there's going to be a failure of therapy.
So all of these skills are observable actions that contribute to the ability to engage in occupations. So examples of motor skills would be your ability to reach, your ability to position your body in space. Process skills would be being able to pay attention and organizing the materials around you. And examples of social skills are being able to start a conversation, to speak fluently, and to express your emotions using words. And finally, we have body functions and structures. So these are the physiological functions of your body systems. Examples of these that you might be familiar with would be your muscle strength, your coordination, your attention, and your memory. While body structures are the anatomical parts of your body that support these body functions. So for example, for you to be able to have muscle strength, you need to have muscles and bones and ligaments. Again, that's a lot, right? Just from occupations and persons. It's like, how do you look at all of those at the same time? But wait, there's more. We have the environment. Wait, Kobe, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Why wouldn't the person just go straight to an occupational therapist instead of a doctor to get an over, overall view of what's going on in their life? Well, that's because if they have a medical condition, sometimes they do need to sort of um, have the clearance first to be able to do therapy. So for example, somebody with blood pressure issues, they might not be able to do therapy because it's not safe for them to do so. So it's a good idea if you have a medical condition to go to a doctor first to get everything checked out because we also use the medical information to inform us about, all right, if this is their diagnosis, um, this is these are probably the difficulties that they're going to have. But we also um, see clients who don't have medical diagnosis. So when that happens, depending on the laws of the country, they can go straight to OTs. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your question, Dr. Lambert. All right, and last we go to the environment. So these are the aspects of the physical, social environment around you that of course affect how you do what you do. The most obvious being, of course, the physical environment. So for example, the outdoors affect the way that you navigate your community. If your streets are well paved, of course, even somebody with who has difficulty with walking or who needs to use a wheelchair may find it easier to walk there versus, for example, an unpaved road. This would be difficult for somebody in a wheelchair to navigate. And in the workplace, the layout of your workspace can affect your productivity and success. So if your workspace is very cramped and it doesn't feel like it's conducive for work, then you might find that you're not as productive as you can be. So products and technology are natural or human-made products that, of course, affect your occupations. Examples of these would be items that you consume, like food and medication, everyday objects you use, like clothing and items in the home like refrigerators, communication equipment like phones, hearing aids. And lastly, your, oh, no, not the last, second to the last, your social environment. So these are your social supports or social networks that provide you with the needed support, nurturing, protection, and assistance that you might need in your everyday life. And lastly, of course, from, from a wider picture, what are the available services, systems, and policies that are designed to meet the needs of persons, groups, and populations? Examples of these would be social assistance programs, public healthcare services, and public utilities. All of these combined create the unique ways that you engage in occupations and participate in life. This is why even though we have general categories, an occupational therapist understands that just because everybody bathes doesn't mean that everybody bathes in the same way, doesn't mean that everybody values bathing in the same way. So for example, there are certain cultures where bathing is extremely important no matter how cold or hot it is outside. And therefore we kind of have to find ways for them to be able to take a bath despite their difficulties. Or for example, there are certain cultures where being independent, for example, in mobility is very important to them um, versus other people or other people in other cultures. And so that's what we want to discover and explore. And in this way, 
occupational therapy is very client-centered because we always look at how the combination of these three factors makes an occupation and the way somebody does an occupation unique to somebody. And then we ask the question, all right, if these are the factors that influence their occupational engagement, where's the breakdown coming from? And what can we do to help overcome that breakdown so that they can do an occupation again? That also means that we can intervene in any of these um, domains. So in that sense, occupational therapy can be fairly complicated. But we'll, we'll give con uh, concrete examples later. So who can get OD services? We'll look at this from an age and conditions perspective. Basically, everyone who may find themselves having difficulty doing their occupations and feel like they need professional help to kind of walk them through it or at least help them figure out solutions to their concerns. So children may have issues because of congenital or acquired conditions that affect their development or skill acquisition. Some examples that you might be familiar with would be like autism, ADHD, or some burns are fairly common among children. And for those who don't have medical conditions, sometimes there are OTs that look into kids who are at risk for juvenile delinquency and similar um, issues. For adults, maybe those children who have congenital conditions grow up to become adults. And of course, they'll still have occupations that they'll have difficulty doing. But more commonly are adults who acquire conditions like traumatic brain injury, like after an accident, usually a motor vehicular accident, a spine injury, or nerve issues like carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, mental health issues like depression, bipolar disorder, all of which affect their ability to do things. And the elderly. So as we age, we naturally lose some of our function as a consequence of aging. So it's a, that's just a natural um, thing that humans go through. And many people are able to age and still live fulfilling lives. But the elderly do have a higher risk for certain medical conditions like blood pressure issues, heart issues, they have lower immunity. And so sometimes they have a lot of um, concerns or medical concerns that affect their ability to function, like having stroke, Alzheimer's disease or dementia, or falls causing injuries like hip fractures. OTs can also do group interventions or target communities. Now, a large majority of OTs are still doing individual client care which is what I do, but there are some OTs that do specialize in groups. So for example, like having a social skills group for adolescents with autism or having a cooking group for stroke patients. And sometimes there are OTs that focus on issues of social and occupational justice and reforms of societal institutions. So we recognize that many disabilities or difficulties in function are not always because of the person, but because of wider policies. Like for example, the lack of accessibility of basic services and public transportation for people of all abilities or maybe a lack of healthcare. So some OTs have taken up those advocacies so that they can have a wider impact on the community. So here we answer the question, now that you have an idea, what is the scope of OT? How do OTs help others? So in general, when it comes to assessment, the goal is to build an occupational profile of the client to identify the occupations that they want to target during intervention and to determine the causes of occupational disruption or why they're unable to do the occupations. So we're gonna look at the PEO factors and see where is the breakdown happening? Is it the person? Are they unable to reach? For example, do they not have the muscle strength or the cognitive skills needed to do an activity? Or is the occupation just too difficult? Is there an easier way of doing that occupation so they can do it? Or is it the environment that's the problem? 
And once we figure out what the cause of the occupational disruption is, then we go to management. And the goal here is to essentially help them be able to do their desired occupations and to participate in life. So goals can be health promotion, remediation or restoration of function, um, modification of occupations and prevention of disability. So here are some ways that OTs help. So for example, for pediatric clients, the common concern is for them to be able to achieve their developmental milestones, like they should be able to walk at a certain age or be able to dress themselves by a certain age. They should be able to play with friends and their schoolmates and be able to participate in school. For the adults and the elderly who lost their occupations because they have a medical condition, we try to help them regain those occupations when possible. But if not possible, then we do replace them, look at other things that they can do to occupy their time. Because we understand that when people lose things that they do, that's when they start off kind of losing their identity or losing their purpose or meaning in life. And so we do this through retraining or modifying their activities and environments. Sometimes we give adaptive devices, like for example, this is a prosthesis, um, and we train clients on how to use them. This does require special, um, special um, training for certain countries. But for example, in the Philippines, um, any OT in the practice of um, physical rehabilitation is usually able to do this. So I'll tell you, as, as a closing, I'll tell you a story about how I figured out kind of it when it clicked for me what OT does, because maybe like some of you, you're still kind of really confused about what do OTs do? So this was very early in my journey as an OT. In fact, I was an undergraduate student. So this was before my internship. I was given a patient, a 45-year-old father with stroke. And what happens when you get a stroke is you lose control of half of your body. So he's unable to move his left arm and he can move his left leg just enough so he can hobble around, but he doesn't, he can't walk. Um, he can't walk the same way that a normal person or a person without stroke would walk. And he's a homemaker. He's in charge of the house. His wife is the breadwinner of the family ever since he got the stroke. And he had two children going to school. When I asked him, what do you want to achieve in occupational therapy? He told me he wanted to be able to cook his kids' school lunches. So I don't know about um, where you're from, but in the Philippine culture, food has a very deep social meaning. A lot of our social activities kind of center around food. And being able to send off your child with school lunches symbolizes the care that parents um, give to their children. And so it's also a way that parents can take care of their children while they're not at home. I remember when I was in grade school, my mother took the time to drop off a hot lunch every day because she did not want me to eat the prepared food in the cafeteria and she didn't want me to eat cold food. And for her and for a lot of Filipino parents, that's part of how they show care and affection to their children. There's also a certain idea that the effort that goes into food communicates the level of care. So for my client, he did not want to buy pre-prepared food and just packed it. He did not want his children to get lunch from school. He wanted to make it himself. So this was something that was very meaningful to him. Now, this client could no longer use his left arm, but he had fairly good balance and he can walk around the kitchen safely. He also had his cognitive functions, and so I knew that he could learn. So I had to find a way to teach him to cook with just one hand. We were very realistic about our goals for that first session. We talked about what he usually cooked before, and we settled on starting with omelets. I spent a week learning how to break eggs with one hand because before this, I didn't know how to cook with one hand. I had to train, you know, 
How am I going to chop using a specific technique with one hand? How do I change his chopping board so that he could make sure that the food doesn't roll off the chopping board when he's chopping? So I had to change his chopping board. I had to teach him how to hold the knife properly and to uh, stabilize the food without using his other hand. And I had to teach him how to crack eggs with one hand. I meet him again for the session and it takes him the whole hour just to make the omelets, just to do the training. And it was very difficult for him. He broke a lot of eggs. Um, there was a part of the slicing that was unsafe, but I was there. I corrected his technique, make sure that he was doing things in a safe way. At the end of the one hour, he makes a simple omelet, just onions, garlic, and eggs. It was not the prettiest omelet in the world. In fact, it was slightly burned around the edges, but it was the first that he made since he got a stroke and he did it on his own. He stares at the omelet for a while with this look of disbelief on his face, like he was in a daze. And then he turns to me, smiles the biggest smile that I've ever seen. And with tears in his eyes, he tells me, thank you. Now I can finally send my kids to school with packed lunches. And that was when I understood what OT is and what the power of occupations can do to define and change our lives. That was just one thing, just cook an omelet and it changed his life then and there. So that's what we do as an OT, uh, as OTs. Find these things that are so meaningful and important for people to do so that they can live fulfilling lives and try to help them to be able to do it again or regain it again if they lost it. So hopefully now you have a better picture of what occupations are and their impact and importance to people's lives. And the thing about living and occupations is, and I mentioned this a bit earlier, we tend to go through our lives on autopilot. We don't look at the way that we do things. We don't think about how do I take a bath or how do I eat until something happens and you're unable to do them. So I'd like to leave you with this question for you to think about after this lecture has ended so that you can think about the things. What is it that you do in your everyday life that gives you meaning and purpose? Who are you as an occupational being? And that ends this lecture. Thank you so much for being an active participant and thank you for sharing and answering uh, the questions earlier. Thank you so much, Faith Kobea. Now, now we're gonna go to the questions. I have to see a question here from Safo Boy. What exactly does the occupational therapist do in the hospital? Right, so this depends on what unit they're in. Um, if they're in the same practice as me, which is an adult physical rehabilitation, usually we do a lot of um, person kind of interventions. Like normally a lot of patients in the hospital are very weak or um, they've lost their coordination because their conditions are very acute. And so we do a lot of like strength training, um, reach and grasp training, maybe some cognitive training. And mostly in terms of occupations, the training that we do with them is their ADLs because they, we want them to be able to take care of themselves before they're discharged from the hospital. And now we have a question from Moji Sola, Esther. Let me ask you Hi, to unmute your microphone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Faith. Okay, my question is, um, I hear you, occupational cycle, um, therapist. How, how is that different from being um, a psychologist or being right. a, um, a therapist? Yeah. So that's always, uh, that's actually the first time that I heard this compared to a psychologist. Normally the question is, how are you different from a physio or a physical therapist? So for occupational therapists, there's a certain overlap in the scope. We handle clients with psychological concerns, but our main concern is their occupations. Whereas a psychologist would probably do more talk therapy to kind of help them thresh out their thoughts, their emotions that may interfere with 
um, their function. So there's, we do, depending on the patients, um, the, sometimes we do have patients where they also have psychological services. Um, but basically, if it's about figuring out their thoughts and emotions and talking to them through it, that's more the domain of psychologists. Whereas for OTs would be for these clients with mental health concerns, they might have problems, for example, sleeping, taking care of themselves, um, doing their work because they, they don't have, a, they, they, can't, they can't pay attention or they can't concentrate. So that's where we come in more. But there's a lot of overlap among like rehabilitation professionals, especially for OTs, because as you can see, our scope is very big. Oh, Dr. Lambert, I think you're not, you're muted. Yeah. Thank you. I was muted. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> there is a comment from Anthony Square. Basically, it's about a person who had sexual dysfunction. And then after six months, they were able, able to perform correctly yeah. in bed. So what do you think? So how does occupational therapy look at sexual dysfunction? Yeah, so that depends on the sexual dysfunction issue. I'm assuming this is a lot is more medical or biological. So for occupational therapists who specialize in sexual dysfunction, there are maybe certain techniques or positions that may be safer for certain conditions. Like for example, if the client has a spine injury and they have problems moving, then an OT can sort of like figure out what are certain um, positions that they can take in bed that will be safe for them and safe for their partner. And then, um, yeah, so a lot, that's going to be a lot more on the physical biomedical part of it. It really depends on how, uh, what, what the cause of the sexual dysfunction is because sexual dysfunction is not necessarily like a medical diagnosis. Usually there's a, there's something else behind it, yeah. Um, question about work burnout. How do you approach work burnout? Yeah, so that would be a little bit more on the mental health aspect of it. What I would look at at work burnout would be the routine. So remember, that's part of the scope of OT, right? And burnout is usually caused by unmitigated stress that occurs for a long time, and it just overwhelms a person's coping abilities. So I would look at the level of stress that they've been under and what they've been doing that's been causing that stress. And are there any ways that we can sort of um, change their routines or what they're doing to manage that stress? And also look at how do these people cope with stress in the first place? So we cope with stress using occupations and sometimes they're not the most effective. So for example, some people cope with stress by playing video games or emotional eating or sometimes addictions. And so of course, those are not very um, effective ways of managing your stress. So what we can also do is to teach them other techniques or ways that they can do to manage their stress, other activities that they can do that will be more effective for them. As you can see, everybody, you can ask about anything anything that can affect a person's ability to function in life and the way the environment affects them, anything, you can ask a question about anything. Think about anything that would affect you or somebody you know. Okay, Monday, we have a question. Hi, Monday. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I want to find out what, how do we, what do we do actually to reduce the stress and um, as much as for God, the truth of the matter is that uh, stress enables us to achieve those things we intended for ourselves. But sometimes it has adverse effects on us, and sometimes it has um, positive effect on us. But the adverse side of it, how do we ensure that uh, it is reduced as much as possible so that the adverse effects will be reduced? How do we do it? Right. So I think Dr. Lambert, that might be a big topic <laughs> for the future, like stress um, management. But in general, you're right. I think you mentioned something about how sometimes stress works for some people. Um, sometimes it makes them more productive. Whereas for some people, a certain level of stress makes them unproductive or makes it difficult for them to function. So it really depends. So this is what I mean by occupational therapy being client-centered. If 
for example, you would be my client, I would be looking at, all right, what is it that you do um, every day that stress is affecting and how is it affecting your work and where is this stress coming from? And then we'll see the way, I, I would look at the ways that we can, um, like I mentioned earlier, either mitigate the stress by looking at changing the things that you do or changing the ways that you cope with stress. But again, this is very, this is very individual to, to a client, very personal. That's all right. That's all right. Thank uh, you. Any other questions? Things that you're thinking about? Are any, is anybody here all of a sudden thinking, wow, this would be really interesting to get into as far as a major. Can you think of somebody in your family who would want to study occupational therapy? Can, can you, is this now something you've never seen before, you've never understood before, and you think, oh, wow, this really is a fascinating area to study and to actually work in. Anybody thinking about that? Any comments? I think there's a comment that do we also do counseling? So we don't do counseling as a major intervention. We use counseling skills in order to be able to talk a client through like doing problem solving with them so that we can go to their occupations. Because sometimes we can't go immediately towards figuring out how to do their occupations because there's something in them that we still need to talk about or problems that we need to solve. So if it's not fairly complex, then an OT can use counseling skills to sort of guide a client through. But if not, I would refer them to a psychologist or a counselor. I would like to know, uh, look around your country. Are occupational therapists common? Because I think in some countries, they're not common yet. Is that correct? No, you know, we're fairly, fairly few. Even in the Philippines, there are only, I think there are like less than 10 schools here in the Philippines. And um, I don't know how many practicing OTs are in the Philippines. There's probably less than 3,000, maybe. It's very, very few. And you basically get your work by networking with psychologists, social, social workers, doctors, you're networking, and then they send clients to you, correct? Yeah, it used to be that all, the, all our clients came from doctors because the law in the Philippines used to be that mm. they have, to have a medical diagnosis, but the law was recently changed um, a few years ago so that anyone can technically refer to us like any profession, health profession that can identify occupational issues so like social work, psychologists, counselors. Yeah. Do you ever get um, referrals directly from the human resources department in a business? I know that there are OTs that sort of do consulting services for um, corporations, but Right now, in terms of like corporate clients, um, I think the corporate culture in the Philippines is not yet geared really towards a lot of well-being, so not much. Um, what's probably more common in corporate settings would be like ergonomics. Um, I do ergonomic evaluations for my patients, but I don't. Uh, I haven't had a corporate client for ergonomics because my practice is more in physical rehabilitation, so that's under my scope. You know, I think I think there may be there's not many questions because I think everybody is still assimilating what this really is about occupational therapy. Yeah, I think uh, even in the Philippines, it's still very common for me to get clients who the first question that I get is, "What is OT? What do you do?" And it takes them maybe five sessions with us to kind of figure out oh, so this is what you do as an OT. This is what I can do as an OT. So it's not really unusual that um, if you're having, still trying to kind of wrap your head around the concept of it, because it is fairly 
complex and especially if the service is not available in your country then the concept of occupational therapy might be a little um, confusing which is why i um, shared that anecdote at the end with my patient so that you can get more of an idea of how we help people i think this is the perfect starting point to just introduce what occupational therapy is and to, you know, to kind of just open up the door to what this is all about and how it can be used to help people. You, know, you have social work, psychology, you have uh, nursing, but occupational therapy will really focus in on things that people, the skills that people can develop. When they have like a, I would, I would guess a hindrance or maybe yeah. a, um, um, you know what I mean? Because when they when they're not, there's so many things. Yeah. But you you're actually working with them to work through these physical, environmental, personal things so that they can function in life. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why it's fairly complex. <laughs> but yet it's very simple when it comes down to exactly what you need to do. That assessment is so important to get it down to what you the first thing you need to work on. And then once you get through that, then life becomes much better. You can start working from there. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm thinking yeah, about the, the gentleman you showed how to cook an omelet. Once he cooked yeah. an omelet, oh, well, maybe now I can cook something else. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and Raul, now George. he's better about his ability to be a parent to his children. So it also fills him with a sense of purpose and meaning, which is the ultimate goal of OT, really. Oh, okay. Um, Roll George again. I think this I, is a very, I think this is a very, very interesting um, um, topical area. First of all, I must commend um, the university for um, their continued um, uh, support of the of all the, the the students in terms of exposing them to a wide and varied um, cross section. And it's not just about the the areas of itself in terms of the areas of study, but also the cross cultural aspect of of information that comes from different environments. That's one. I also want to um, give um, credit to, um, to the lecturer. I believe and I think that um, your, your presentation was so structured and orderly, and it was uh, very, very um, simple. It made it very easy for me to, to um, assimilate the information and understand it. But I think two things um, that, that I, I want, to, want to make reference to that I think is, is of importance. Um, one is the, um, the aspect of the, um, well, you deal more so with the individual aspect of it, I, I would tend to um, presume, all right? But in your, in your lecture discussion, your interaction with us, I recognize that you spoke about an area that becomes critically important, I believe for all of us, because we are cross-cultural, um, in our interaction with the university and with, with um, people itself, especially within the global environment. What is Im important in this whole um, occupational, um, uh, occupational um, schema is the fact that you made a reference to occupational therapists could also deal with populations. And what is, what is important is something that I think the scope of, occupation, of the occupational um, therapy aspect of it becomes um, so essential, more so for the global environment. And why I am saying that, because I've been following clear, um, carefully what has been happening with, um, with the interplay of the East and the West and the African nations relative to this whole LGBTQ, U and uh, plus um, 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 situation. And I'm wondering from your own perspective, Seeing that this is this is a global situation where you have, based on what I have read, you have the African countries wanting to maintain their generally indigenous um, disposition, and you have the the um, the West is indicating. Listen, we are looking at it for this situation from a human rights perspective. On account of it being a human rights perspective, we want to impose that cultural engineering or orientation from the West into the African environment, which um, seems, especially from the leadership, to be resistant. Now, I would really like to see 
or would like to get a perspective from you. How do you think that the occupational therapist disposition could have an interplay to treat with the, the, um, um, the kind of disconnect with the West the, um, cultural disposition and uh, the African or other disposition that would want to resist the overt aspect of this, um, this um, human rights issue, as they say, with the LGBTQ plus um, um, environment. I hope that um, you understood where I was coming from. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's a fairly complex question that I think I will answer both as an occupational therapist and somebody who's in the study of medical anthropology. So, of course, at uh, one point, it depends on which communities it is that we are targeting or serving um, or who are is availing of our services. And so for occupational therapists, the core of our belief is that every life, every person deserves human dignity and value. And that's why everyone should be able to do the occupations that give them human dignity and allow them to lead fulfilling lives. At the same time, occupational therapists now, I think there's also a lot of talk in it right now in international spaces that there's also cultural aspects, a lot of cultural aspects to occupation, you know, what's acceptable in one culture and what's probably not acceptable in a certain culture. And so I think this was this was even before the pandemic, but there are there are actually occupational therapists from Africa. I think the last the World Federation of OT um, meeting was actually in South Africa. This was in 20, I think, I'm not mistaken. I think it was in 2019. And there was a movement there to, they call it decolonializing OT. Um, I think the main point there is that every country should develop sort of its own framework for OT because occupations are so cultural. You know, how you give meaning to OTs, uh, to, to occupations, to what you do, what is acceptable for your culture, what is adaptive or helpful for your culture can be different in other ways. And so while there is a universal tenet in OT that every human life is has human dignity, you know, regardless of their gender, their ethnicity, their age, their ability, their disability, everyone is deserving of human dignity. How that will look like in practice will really differ from country to country and culture to culture. So I think there are occupational therapist associations in South Africa who are threshing this out um, for themselves. And in the same way, I mentioned earlier, right, that our framework is very American because the occupational therapy schools in um, the Philippines, the, the, well, what the, the, the school that I'm part of was actually created by um, people who were trained in America because OT started in America. But we're also seeing things that are not applicable to our culture. I mentioned it earlier, like, for example, the focus on independence. So Philippine, Filipinos are very interdependent, especially families. It's not unusual to see like generations living together in one household, like grandparents, uncles, aunts, and therefore the focus on independence is not as strong as it is, for example, in America. Here it's okay if the elderly live with their children or with their grandchildren and are helped by their grandchildren. They don't feel like they are lesser or that they're less pe less of a person because they need help. Whereas what we see in, for example, the West or in America, there's a very, very huge um, premium on being independent, living independently, no matter their age. So those are some cultural differences. Um, and that, that doesn't mean that um, the, the Western view is wrong or the Philippine view is wrong. It's just that there's a very different valuing of certain values um, based on culture. So I hope that answers your question role the best thing would be that you have occupational therapists there who will be able to sort of start that conversation and figure out um, what occupational therapy would look like um, in your country you know it's almost that um, occupational therapy therapy is part of this industrialization of the world where people are moving to cities and families are getting more more spread apart by distances 
So you need these services that sometimes families used to do in the past. You need support services within your community now to help you with these things. And that brings in occupational therapists who used to be kind of like family members doing these things, helping you through, let me, you know, let me help you cook that, things like that. But then all of a sudden you don't have those people around because they're working 10, 12 hours a day and, or they're off, they moved to another part of the city for whatever. And so occupational therapists come in to fill that need that somehow gets fragmented off through industrialized societies. And that's happening all around the world. Yeah, that's a very um, interesting view, I think, especially if you live in um, places, yeah, where intergenerational households suddenly are no longer there. And of course, there's now a lack of support, maybe institutionalized support services. So that's also where OTs can come in. Like how many people are at a, at a job and they get injured in that job and they go home and they live alone? How many people do you know like that? Oh, for in me? Yeah, in, in your work. Actually, not a lot in the Philippines. Normally, my clients live with their families. And so um, there are people around them. But the common thread, at least in Filipino culture, is they want to be able to do things so that they're not a burden to their families. So they don't want to do things to be independent. They want to do things so they can help their families. So culturally, when does someone come to you instead of their family? Normally, they come to us because their doctor told them to come to us. <laughs> right now, we're still there because OT is still very unknown in the Philippines. But we do hope that eventually there would come a time when maybe they would come to us because they're, they've tried solving things and doing things with just their families and their support networks and they've figured out that maybe we need somebody else to help us through this and that's where we would come in here here at EIU there's a lot of students who have studied occupational therapy many 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 in Africa so there is there are occupational therapists throughout Africa even from our own university so um this is recognized as an important part of someone's career. Actually having a job, learning this, becoming and becoming an occupational therapist and making money. So this is happening around the world. And I think you can see from this presentation by Faith Kaube that occupational therapy is needed more than you might think. It really is an essential part of keeping everybody productive and moving forward in their life. You know, I guess, Faith Kobe, think of all the things that can keep someone from really enjoying their job, doing a good job, being motivated by their job, physical, everything. So, yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Normally what I encounter because of my practice are people who get injuries from their jobs, like getting carpal tunnel syndrome because they're always typing on a desk or because they're always sitting down they don't get physical activity their blood pressure and their um, health isn't good so they get a stroke um, yeah so those are usually the kinds of clients that I see uh, there's a question here how many years does it take to train as OTs in the Philippines about four years but it can vary. I think there are other um, certifications and program pathways, like for example, in the US that are shorter or have certain other levels. Like you start at a certain level and then you progress towards an OD um, degree. But in the Philippines, it's around four. It's the internship, I think, is the critical point because you can learn the basics and the theories of everything about occupational therapy, but it's when you start putting things into practice in an internship that you really begin to see what this is all about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we try to get our students into different internship placements. So we try to get them into pediatrics and then adult um, mental health, adult physical rehabilitation. We also have community rotations. Um, 
and other rotations where they kind of pick where they want to be in. So yeah, we try to get them as much experience possible. But that's in the Philippine setting. I know that I think in other countries that they kind of specialize right off the bat. Like I want to go into pediatrics. So all their internships are in pediatrics. But in the Philippines, they need to have a varied um, complement of experience for internship. Our internship is one year. And keep that in mind, any student in another major, if you want to do an internship, where you actually go and, and just sort of volunteer your work in a business or an organization, or even a psychological clinic, wherever it can be, you can do that. We can set up a course for you so you can actually do your internship. So keep that in mind. If, you, if there's any place that you would like to practice your studies. Um, Faith Kaube, I don't see a lot of questions here. So do you have anything more that you would like to add? Because I think we'll be closing now. I think just the, um, think I, the, the, we're, there's actually a, there's like, I'm really happy with the responses and the questions and the participation that we got from the class because I'm also learning from you um, the things that, you know, that you value or the things that come to your head when you think of OT also teaches me about what it is that's important to you as a person and probably your group. Um, in terms of what Odi can do for you. So thank you also for the learning. Okay, last chance for any questions. Otherwise, we're going to close this. And we look forward to having you back, Faith Kaube, because there's, like you say, we can talk about stress, big issue in occupational therapy, anything physical that's going on, social things to work through, how you deal with that. There's so many other issues that you can focus in on. So keep that in mind. And we would like to have Faith Kobe back because truly this is an important field of study that needs to be talked about more because it's so practical and so useful when you need it and someone's there to help you work through what you need to work through and so you can get back into life. Having somebody there to work with you on this practical basis is so important. Um, I think with that, there's no more questions. Faith Kaube, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you also, Dr. Lambert, for I'm going this to, everybody to can, share. Everybody can unmute themselves to say thank you and bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. They're all, I think if you can unmute your microphones. There you go. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for presentation. Bye -bye. This is amazing. All thank right. you. And come back tomorrow. Tomorrow there'll be another live lesson at the same time. See you then. Okay. Thank you, Bye. sir. Oh, let me check real fast to see what it's going to be on tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about um, education, the sensitive times for kids in, during their education. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye, you so much, sir. Faith Kobe.